So what I'd love to know before we kick it off, so I can ask the right question, so we can move this in the right direction. Can you please just let me know as quickly as possible, or as you know, shortly and uh, as possible, or in as much detail as you like, what's the main reason you're here today? What brought you along to the session? What do you want to hear? What is there something specific you wanted to answer in your business? Are you a user? Just to give me a bit of a sense of, um, you know, what it is we should be focused on, or the questions we can ask. So again, oh Dan's there, test okay. Um, but yeah, try that in the Q in the Q and A would be perfect. I might turn this off for the moment. Uh, Donna integration options, perfect. So we need to have a bit of a conversation about where it fits in with other things, I, I'm guessing, and I'm reading between the lines. I think that's probably really relevant in this case uh, because uh, work sort of is what I, I, my understanding is one of those tools that works best when playing with other systems. So what else? Uh, Amy, she she's a user of WorkSorted. It was interested in the backstory and these news on the future. We're definitely going to talk about the future. I like talking about the future because most, I find most tools, you know, they, they're, they're being created according to, you know, a roadmap. And I think it's really, really interesting to understand where that's going. So some really good stuff there. What else? What else? Tim, making X plan more user friendly. Okay. We'll definitely dive into a bit of this. What else has brought you here today? Would love a couple more answers. Alex, Stephen, I'm keen to hear what Dan's biggest challenges have been growing the business. People funding, we'll definitely throw that one out. Perfect. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, Alex has also worked sort of user and would love to know Dan's favorite tips or hacks. What are the best automated processes Dan has seen in the system? All right, cool. That gives us some really good um, stuff to work with. So let's jump into this and let's uh, welcome the man of the moment. Dan, are you there, mate? Yes, Stu, I'm here. Good morning. Nervously yours, mate. How are you? I'm, I'm, I'm good. It's Friday. I've got, Perfect. I've got, uh, I've got the weekend. I say off from the kids, but we're we're going to go and do adulting for a little bit, which is going to be fun. Nice. Uh, I understand it's raining where you are. It is raining, and I won't have the luxury of being kid free this week with three under four. Wow. In my household, so it should be a busy one. That is that is a different level of logistics. I feel. Yeah. Well, that's when it. Adding, adding, added to that is two from a prior, so that's uh, it, it gets pretty busy around here at times. Wow, you should try TV sometimes. It's, it's a good alternative <laughs> yeah, use of you. your spare time. <laughs> um, mate, let's dive into this because I'm, I've got, as you can see, there's a lot to to, to get through, and I know we've yes. got some we've got some users here. So look, let's just kick it off by saying I'm not. I don't want to assume that everybody knows you, or so mm. for those who haven't sort of heard of X Work Sorted, or they maybe know a little bit about it, and they maybe don't know who you are. Can you give us a bit of overview of what it is? How it works, who it's for, and and your involvement in it. Yeah, uh, what works sorted is is a is a, a web based application that's used um, by financial advice businesses principally across our country. Uh, it's a system that I founded back in two thousand and ten, uh, or near enough to that. Um, so we've been steadily building, growing out our clientele, our client base, um, uh, steady as she goes, profitably, sensibly, patiently, building up <laughs> a, a business. Um, which uh, and somewhat differently, I guess, from the way some of these, um, well, FinTech didn't exist when we first created this, but now it's a thing. Um, so we're not one of the cool kids that goes and raises shit tons of money and pees it up against the wall really quickly. We've just done it really slowly and steadily out of good old conservative Adelaide. Um, and yeah, a, a few on the call, we do call our customers and have for quite some years from, from the names I saw before. Um, but yeah, we're a... a um, we're still behaving somewhat like a startup and trying to get our name out there and, and just keep you know keep the wheels moving. It's funny. I, I I was speaking to Robert Skinner. You might know Robert. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, and he, he we were talking about the fact that there was a time when it wasn't called fintech. It was just software for for advice businesses, and it sort of kicked in and changed. Yeah. And it's it's changed massively over the last five years. I mean, you go back to 2014, there just was nothing there, and now there's maybe too many options. Would you agree? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't agree there's too many options. I think we, sh we could do with a hell of a lot more options. But um, I think, unfortunately, we've been beholden to some incumbents that um, mm -hmm. uh, are pretty hard to wrestle out of, of their stronghold. A um, whole bunch of reasons for that. But no, I think it would be nice to have more technology available to people to choose. And in fact, I think there is a plethora of things that are available, whoever it was that asked about integrations. I mean, um, integrations opened up the world you know apis and webhooks open up the world to all manner of integration options and for advisors and advice businesses to use new tech that's out there um, and some pretty cool tech that's there so no I, I say we need more um but i i think um the workload maybe needs to be spread and uh, eyes need to be a little bit 
more widely open to new technologies than the industry has been in the last 10 to 15 years. Fair enough. Can I, I'm, I'm interested to know, how, how did you end up in the in, industry? Because not only in the financial service industry, but then you've got this subset is of fintech. And whenever yeah. I've spoken to people, it's not, it's not a direct line. It tends to be, you know, uh, an interesting story. How did you, how did you get in here? Um, well, I tried to get out at one point. I sold a business a few years ago um, that, that Olic, I think you mentioned in your introductory thing. Uh, yeah. Out. But um, my love of computing goes back a hell of a long way, actually. Um, I was fortunate my old man was an engineer with Postmaster General and then Telecom and then Telstra. So wow. in, in that capacity, through the 1950s and 60s, um, he had a very strong love of gadgets, think gadgetry things, you know. Um, and I remember, and also for building things, um, he was a, a, a very good carpenter. Um, in his day, he's still ticking along, but he's not doing much carpentry anymore. But I, I remember in his shed, I found what appeared to be a, a bomb, in fact, because it was a, a briefcase. And uh, in the briefcase was uh, like a, a, a keypad and it was all padded with some foam. And there was a keypad in there. And, and then there was a display of about only, I don't know, 15 or 16 digits. So it looked like, you know, that typical bomb that you see in the, in the yeah. movie, right? And I thought, what on earth is this? And he shared with me that it was a one of, he claimed it to be one of the first ever personal computers and, <laughs> and somehow commandeered it through his many years at, at Telstra. And it sat in the shed, so I blew the dust off it, opened it up, and he promised that he'd teach me how to, how to program it. But it was really just like a calculator, right? It didn't have much function in it, but and a very basic kind of, keypad that you would enter stuff into and there was nothing really attached to it so it was a standalone computer uh, unfortunately in some ways it was only codable using hexadecimal straight out right straight hex so i had to learn a wow. about nine or ten and he taught me hex coding onto this little computer thing but so so that was where it started my first love of kind of tech and gadgets and i was intrigued by what you could do on this very basic machine but then the Commodore 64 came along and he and I used to <sighs> duck code um, in basic as it was. We'd copy, you know, scripts out of the books that yeah. before came with. We'd create our little inventions, save them to the, the tape that went, you know, the tape deck that went with the Commodore 64. Forgive me for anyone that's, <laughs> that's thinking this is like way back when and this guy must be super old. But um, so the C64, he and I used to program it together. And so I, I sort of love computers. And that, that was the tech side of Dan from my foundations. In terms of the finance side, um, actually, Donna, who's on this call, I must uh, confess, I think she's still on the call. Stu, she hasn't dropped off yet. Donna is my first cousin, and I think she may have played a role in this next part of the story. Uh, <laughs> a few years my senior, but Donna went on a trip with my sister, more than one trip, I think, like around the world sort of trip. And anyway, my sister, elder sister, came back from one of these journeys with having been to the New York Stock Exchange with two things. One was a poster of a million dollars cash and wow. up. So that, that stayed on my wall for many, many years through my teenage years and a T-shirt that said something to the effect of money talks, bullshit walks from the <laughs> exchange. And so I wore that around proudly as a, a guy who loved a little bit of finance and saving money and those sorts of things. So I've had FinTech in my veins for many, many years, but now it's just formulated in a new term. So well, let's, Try to cut the story a little bit shorter. Could be here all day, but no, that's um, good. Uh, yeah. I was intent on a medical degree. Uh, well, that was sort of where the where those around me seemed to be, want want me to drop into. But I dropped out of pretty quickly, and I I found a job in a building society as the mail boy. Uh, and so I my career progressed in finance from there. I was working full time, studying. I did a, a business and an honours degree in economics. So I've, I've always kind of had this kind of computing, product management, software, and finance stream. And then okay. in terms of funds management, I popped into Zurich. Um, my former business partner in Olic, uh, the co-founder of that, Cliffy Garrels, um, yep. brought me across into Zurich somewhere around 1998. Um, and we commenced Olic some years later in 2004. Um, so, so Olic was, for those who haven't heard of it, it, was, it, it has some functions that, that exist in work sorted today, an emphasis on revenue management and workflow. Um, it yep. sort of does a lot more than, than Olic ever did. Um, but so we sold that and 
alongside that, sorry, just to digress a touch, um, I had an involvement in my first wife now, and I we created a financial planning business in 2002, and we were acquiring businesses, and um, I think we purchased three or four. So we built that up. She still runs it. Um, um, she's work sort of client or company number one still to this day. Um, yeah. So there's always been a strong, you know, running the things in tandem, software alongside the, the real business of advice. Um, and that's worked well for us, I think. One thing I'm going to, uh, it's interesting because Oleg was actually, so I spent a lot of time working with Cliff when I was at Hill Ross. Yep. And we brought Oleg in. We also looked at Easy Brokerage, which I think was the main oh, yeah, sole competitor at the time. Yeah, yeah, and well, I remember yeah. I remember yeah. when Cliff sort of came and said, we sold to Macquarie. And yeah. I used to joke. I was like, well, can I, you know, okay, so don't forget to invite me on your boat when you bought it. But um, yeah. Yeah. I know he works, he, I don't think we met during those years, but I know he worked really hard to get that off the ground. And, yeah. and it, was a great, it was a great tool, really effective, really yeah. useful. Yeah, we were only just really kicking it off when it sold and, um, uh, you know, Probably in hindsight, we we shouldn't have sold so quickly. Um, we could have done a whole lot more with it, and and also in hindsight, I'm not necessarily sure that that. And I, I hold this view to the day that I don't think that um, the objectives of the Macquarie and its platform are kind of consistent with what our objective should have been. But you know, right? It's fine. You know, it's um, it, it worked out very very well. We were quite happy with that. I took a couple of years off after it, but yeah, I still found that. We needed to, and in terms of where work sorted came from, uh, the needs were still there in the practice, and there were a growing set of needs in practices. And and Oleg and Coin and Macquarie just weren't kind of moving quickly enough, um, in my view. Uh, you've got an interesting, just, interesting blend of experience in the in the technology space, and you've got an interesting blend of experience in the financial planning space. And I know there's been a lot of uh, providers or developers who've come from one or the other angle, you know, planning businesses who've gone out and built their own software yeah. and software providers. Uh, how, how important do you think it is when you're building any sort of solution that's going to be used to have both of those, the ability to understand it from both angles? Or do you think one is more important than the other? Um. I think the most important thing in neither of those, actually, I think the most important thing is to be able to sit between the two things. So, okay. yeah, whilst I've been involved in financial advice firms, I've not been and never intended to be an advisor. It just doesn't sit with me. I have absolute respect for what they do. On the other side, whilst I used to cut code back in the 80s on the C64, I can't, I haven't written a line of code in, in work sort of, in fact, that's not true. One line of code under strict supervision and, and with some <laughs> but, uh, it was a fun thing on a Friday for me to actually do it some years ago now. But so not being able to do that, my job has just become not to be one or the other or strong in one or the other, but to be the intermediator between what one's asking for and to speak a little bit of geek on the other side to get yeah. into what developers need. So, yeah, I, I think I've got strong fundamentals in finance and in technology, but I don't yeah. have the skills to do what um, the, the, the builders do on one hand and the planners do on the other or, or the vice firms. Got it. So you've, you've been involved in OLEC. You've had the financial planning business. You've sold uh, OLEC. You've then had a couple of years off. Yeah. Is, is that when work sorted start, started? Yeah. I, I work sorted was meant to be, um, initially was designed to be a, a workflow system that operated outside financial services it, not so not specific to financial services okay um, but yeah as i said i tried you know try to get out of financial technology once before but you sort of get drawn back into it and i, I was there was just such a a growing need of of things within advice firms that weren't being delivered by tech um many of those arguably still haven't been delivered by tech but so i wanted it to be outside and that's where work sorted was going to be you know much broader and stronger than anything i built before but what transpired is that work sort of ended up back in the financial stream. You know, I'm talking, it only ever really stood out for a year or two uh, outside the sector. But I also branched the product off into <clears throat> another solution for registered training organisations. So instead of creating something that could fit into any industry, I've now got two industry-specific tools that... Um, you ever had a, you've ever had a call about the we work book thing or they just left yeah. you alone? I beg your pardon? Was. You ever had a call? You know, it's called We Workbook, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You ever had a call from uh, yeah, the work. guy that's gone? Yeah, We Work? No, not at all. Um, 
I was out before them actually, but not not that they'd worry too much about that. But <laughs> yeah, it was it was just Facebook was around going, no, this is just a we work book. It's, we we're working. We're workers, we're not bloody mucking around on social media. But <laughs> fair enough. I've thought about um, changing the name a hundred times, but I really can't be bothered. I, I remember when we first launched Olic, um, and there was a story behind that name. I won't uh, detail to you now, but people said, oh, what a stupid bloody name. But it doesn't really matter what you call the thing. It's what it becomes. So it's, It was memorable. People never forgot it. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I still actually don't know what it means. So why did you start it as, firstly, why, why were you focusing on work, workflow mm. and why outside of advice to begin with? Oh, well, um, outside of advice was just for a bit of, um, you know, a bit of a challenge to learn something new and expose myself in business to certain different things and different sectors. Um, and of course, to scale it, you know, beyond financial services and certainly financial services in Australia. So, so it was a generalist solution for who are, yeah, okay, cool. Right. Yeah. So it was, and that was predominantly because you felt like building something that was available to everybody was going to, was going to be an easier growth. Yeah. Thing. An easier thing. But, you know, I look at tools now like Salesforce, which, you know, had work sort of become that kind of industry independent tool. Um, it would look a lot like Salesforce, but, but then you see how much people need to spend on, on customizing something like Salesforce down into our industry. So I'm sort of glad I didn't end up there. And I, I, I much prefer that we've got something that's available off the shelf, sure, customizable, but it's, it is built for our industry sector. It's not, you know, trying to be all things to everybody. How long did it take you before you realized that going down the, the generalist route wasn't going to work and, and then bring you back to advice? Yeah, I, I didn't sort of wake up one day and have that realisation. It just, it, it was probably only for a year and a half, two years that I was kind of thinking, yeah, let's make this the generalist tool. Um, so it happened very quickly that it was brought back in. But it could have also been a function of my connections already being in financial services and, yeah. and what I'd done before. And they were looking at this going, oh, well, yeah, we know this is going to fit in our firm. So, yeah, I, I was trying to be something a little bit broader, but it's okay. I'm not unhappy that I'm where I'm at today with it. It's... Uh, it's worked out quite well. So early, when you were building the workflow s- software, when you look at what it's become now and back then, mo- most people I speak to when they're developing it, they start off, if they're structured, they're going, right, I'm going to build a software solution that solves these particular problems. Mm-hmm. What, what were you trying to, to focus on at the beginning and how has that changed? Um, yeah, I reflected on that um, because you were kind enough to shoot me out a couple of prompters for today. And, um, but actually, the notes I wrote down are probably a little bit inconsistent with what I'm going to say now, um, because I, I think actually what we set out to, to achieve, the problems still exist. Um, I don't think, which is a, a bit of a, an indictment on tech, I think. And um, I think, you know, Stuart, when we, we spoke a few weeks ago, we were having a, a chat similar to this, is, is that we, we've not solved the problems. You know, I, don't, I, I think these problems still exist. Like our market share is pretty low. We sit somewhere around 10%, I suppose, um, it, depending on which part of our application, whether it's the CRM, the document management, the revenue management. So just call it somewhere around 10%. So it's it's not just a function of our systems not in use in 100% of practices, so the problem's not solved. But I, I think tech, the tech plays haven't delivered what they should, and we've still got a lot of work to do to help practices run even better. So, you know, even 12 years into this one, I, I don't. I think the problems still exist. Some new problems have come along, particularly around compliance. You know, more yeah. disclosures and, and so on. But so there's a growing set of problems. Um, but the fundamental problems I was trying to solve, back to your question, were um, too much emphasis is being placed on the actual production of advice piece. You know, it was all okay. about. It's all about the SOA. You know, it still is to a great extent with many tech, you know, shiny toys that pop up here and there. It's about, you know, they've become about lifestyle advice and, you know, living your best life and um, building a, a, you know, this end-to-end process. But that to me isn't really the problem in an advice practice. It, advice doesn't cease, right? You don't get to the end of the advice process and say, oh, we're done now. It's end-to-end now. I think that's espoused a bit by those who think that the end is a, a sale on a platform or a sale of an insurance product and, and, and fulfilling that sale. But advice goes on. So what we were trying to get to was solving the fact that the majority of stuff that happens in a device business is not producing an SOA. It takes up a ton of time, but it's not the fundamental problem. The problem is the day-to-day 
let's call it, you know, review processes and and forms and switches and, you know, all the little stuff that goes on Absolutely. in the team. So our focus has always been on that, that the stuff that's done most in a firm as opposed to the things that are necessarily taking up a lot of time, but yeah. the things that other people were spending a, a ton of money and a ton of technology was coming out to try to solve. So we're still solving the same problems, but we haven't fixed them all yet. Okay. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? You're, you're spot on with that. There is so much focus on building the documentation, but... I mean, once you get above a certain level, how, how you remember to, to deliver what you want to deliver in the systematic way and get the team doing it, that becomes the main, the main problem. Yeah, and, yeah, and so some things have, some tailwinds have, have helped us, of course, too, with things like disclosure changes and, and fees for no service and, um, you know, the need to bring together your workflow and your service packaging delivery in yeah. your revenue. That, that's fallen into our, our laps a little bit um, over the years. So, um, you're, you're, it's been a 12 year journey. So, there's a lot, so there must be a lot to take in. Has yeah. it been a fairly um, consistent journey, or have there been bumps along the road, you know, things that you hit and realized, you know, this isn't working and you had to change direction? Um, no, it's been fairly steady. Um, okay. We have had a, a very steady list of, because, I, and I think that's because we haven't ever needed to focus on. Uh, let's call it like the institutional sale, like selling to a uh, selling our software into a large organization. Um, we have we've stretched ourselves into sort of the, the mid tier um, licensees, who some of whom will will not mandate, but you know get our software out. But we've always stayed focused on the individual practice, so it's been it's been good feedback and easy to collect feedback from the real people on the ground in practice land. Um, and so that's been good for us. Whereas my understanding and talking around the traps to other tech providers is sometimes when you get that big client, that can give, that can bring in, it can be wonderful for your cash flow and for your business and for your growth, but, and for your valuation potentially, but it can really stifle your business. So I think what we've done well is we've stuck to, we've got a single system. Um, it, it's a set of tools that every advice practice has got availability to. We don't, have modules we don't, you know, like we've we've structured it so that everyone gets access to all of the things that we've created over the years. So I found it a fairly steady um, path to where we are now. Um, growth has has sort of, you know, up and down. You know, you get get your good years of stronger growth than others, but um, I think it's been a fairly steady path from my perspective. Have you ever been tempted to go for the the, the you know the corporate route? Because it can, yeah, you know, I mean, it, it it can be an absolute cash flow influx it can see massive growth yeah you just said yeah not gone there yeah um i mean i guess it would be sensible to say i wouldn't say no people might be listening in going oh well, we're thinking of using works order, but i'm about to say no we don't want you um <laughs> you know of course you but um it just hasn't been our focus and and i i do think that the industry has held itself back a little bit as far as tech goes because the decision makers in institutional land don't look at businesses like mine with a small team of punters with a you know nice broad cross section of clients across many many licensees with different kinds and shapes of practices they don't look at businesses like mine and go oh yeah we'll go with you i i think somewhat dangerously at times they make decisions based on what others do and, and they, so yeah. they look at that's back to the the power of being the incumbent. I mean, I remember the days back at um, at MLC. You might have been there at the time when Advisor Central was being built, and uh, at that time, MLC decided that it would head down for the Advisor Central build. They they put some software in. So it would busy. I, think I was involved. I was actually involved in that. Yeah, I mean, and the decision was not to go with Xplan because Xplan was too young, too fresh, too new, too, yeah. too different, too different. You know, it would have been really stepping out on a limb. So, you know. That's that's just the way sometimes the insos build, um, are, are built and how they make decisions, and that's a little bit inconsistent with who we are and who we want to be, um, generally speaking. But you know, I'm sure if they're listening, I'd probably throw AMP's decision to go with Coin over uh, over the other one is another example. I was at Hill Ross at the time, and one yeah. of the things we were arguing for is, well, if you're going to roll out Coin to the whole of AMP, why don't you roll up another tool within Hill Ross and use it as a as a as a proving ground because then you can. But they chose not to. It's funny going back to the advisor central. Can I tell you a little story about that? Because I was actually working sure, with Mark. It's um at the time I was working with Mark Ballantyne, who ended up yeah. becoming sort of head of um, financial wisdom. But 
one of the things we did is we got together all of these pieces of software and went out to a group of advisors. And at the time, the advisors, we used something called Workbench, oh, yeah. which was collo- colloquially internally known as Don't Work, Doesn't Work Bench <laughs> or Work Bitch occasionally. Um, and we took, the, we took the version that we had created, the AMLC had basically just you know, plotted, changed it and modified it. And we took the original version. You know, the, yeah. And guess which ranked higher? The original ver- advisors ranked the original version, which hadn't been bastardized and, and messed around with as, as one of the best tools out there. So it goes to show you, you're spot on. Sometimes it's mm. kind of like, ca- you know, you, you, a camel is a, is, a, is a horse designed by a committee. It comes, sometimes gets in the way. Yeah, and, and that also too often you see that they'll pick up your software and say, yeah, that's great, we want that, but we want our own version in our own walls, in our, under our own servers. We don't trust you with, with whatever, with the data. And so we want that's to do right. it our way. And then we want to create a separate version. And it's like, man, that'd, that'd, that'd blow my mind it, running two it's, systems like this. You know, it's hard enough running one. I read an article a while ago called The Problem with CRMs, and I was trying to be as balanced as I could. But one of the things that I pointed to was the fact that um, – in tech startups, when you're in startup phase, your goal is to get as close to the possible as the end user you can because you'll learn about what you need to happen. And the problem is, is if your customer and the end user are different people and you're, build, you're developing f- to sell to the, to the – and this isn't critical of institutions. If, if, if the person making the decision is not the person who's using the tool, then you're going to end up with something that's designed for a scope rather than designed for purpose. And that's, yeah. that's, that's a bad situation to be in, yeah, I feel. Exactly. And also sometimes it's often the case that – firms aren't necessarily ready for what you're building. And that's um, that's a big challenge that we've had over the years. You know, we've built so much so fast, build, get it to market really quickly, but forget to kind of loop that back into the existing firms that we have. So yeah. you know, people are asking, well, perhaps there was one question earlier about how do I get more out of it? You know, there's so much in the WorkSword system now that it has become, and I'm sad to say, you know, our, our there is so much more our practices could could get out, but they're not, you know, so it's it's value that we're leaving off the top, you know, that they should be able to pick up and, and run with. But so we've got a challenge on that. Um, but you're right, you've got to keep listening to the customer and um, focus on what they're looking for. I was going to ask about failures, but let's let's progress it because I think there's a few questions in here about the tool. Can you give us a sense of how the tool has evolved and what it what it looks like today in terms of, you know, functionality and, and the focus? Um, yeah, okay. Um, there would be, I've lost count. I'm just thinking of what our, our current um, dev list numbers up to. It's somewhere around 9,000, I think. That's on top of 10,000 in our old workflow, our own internal uh, development workflow system. So there's about 20,000 things that we've done over the years. 20,000. 20,000. 20,000 individual tasks. 10, 10 plus 9, 19,000 actual activities. So this is, so just to be clear, this is this is development cycles, things yeah. that you've added. Yes, yeah, these are individual tasks that sit, you know, within development cycles and releases. Uh, we release things very quickly. We have a, I won't say a daily release cycle, but it's it's at least weekly. Um, so we have built a lot of things in and on the system, <laughs> but fundamentally, it stays. It, it has stayed true to its core. Um, it. It focuses on workflow management, but all the things over and above basic workflow management are checklists and rules and automated processes and um, uh, workflow document creation because that sits, of course, on, you know, we're a CRM system. I mean, make of that what you will, but, you know, it's the place where I think we store about 2 million, do- 2 million client records in our system. There's around 16 million coming up 16 million file notes exist work sorted so it's got big right there's a lot of but fundamentally it's yeah like you've written there Stu, um checklists automations basic tasking sharing of workflow um we from its outset how i mentioned it was built for other industries and other sectors it was also designed for um what, what i guess we call outsourcing um one and one step further offshoring because it was designed to have the workflow shared outside or actually not even considering an individual organization so it was a kind of network of collaboration and so that's held us in good stead and still to its core it delivers for um, advice firms that are offshoring Um, our pricing model is suitable for that you can have as many users as you like so 
we've we've kind of stayed fundamentally true to a workflow focused application. On the revenue side, again, the needs are much the same. You know, it's you, you, you're buying a book. Um, you need to track the revenue that's coming in. You um, you need to understand your own revenue by client, for goodness sake. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that many were accused of not understanding who they were making money from or how much and certainly not disclosing yeah. it. So, so revenue tracking, super powerful. Um, and also revenue, uh, on top of the revenue tracking, one of the bigger pieces of work that we did was, and we now support this with our, our own services, service model is it's not just the understanding of inbound revenue, but also the, the calculation and remittance of payments to advice practices and advisors. So it's inbound and outbound revenue management. And so we've got a, um, a service that we offer to kind of take that away from licensees and from practices as well. It's um, funny. I- I remember there was a business at Hillross. I think they used Olek, and it, what it was, it was a, it was a multi generational business. The son had taken over from the father, and they came in and ran Olek, and he discovered he'd been underpaid by MLC, AMP by about 20 years. Yeah. Oh, and it was right. a significant amount of money. It was crazy. Yeah, mate. And that's what I said before. Like, we haven't solved the problem yet. Like, they're, um, I was talking with an advice practice who, they're in acquisition mode. Um, they were in our office just a couple of weeks ago, a client of ours. They found 23% underpayments on the transition of a book. Oh, that, man. But it's just they failed to switch the advisor code from that to that, so they didn't get paid. Um, so it's it, it's terrible. It's an indictment on our industry, but it's it's still a problem this very day. Um, I mean, how many how many mainframe systems are they still running on the back end in, in major institutions? It's, yeah, I don't, it's, I don't know. I don't it's got to be a few, right? I don't know. Yeah. So anyway, does that answer your question, I coached you on? I think so. Workflow is a big one. Yeah. And you've, you've made a lot of enhancements along the way, but you've kept the focus on, okay, really what we're trying to do is help people manage, you know, the, the delivery of tasks via automations. Client records is a big one and revenue tracking, which is obviously the genesis of, of yeah. where you're, yeah. Yeah. And so can I just throw in on there and I yeah. to mention um, where we've invested a fair bit of time and effort in the last couple of years is integrations. Um, someone asked about that earlier. Yeah. Um, what's possible to integrate? So we see it as two kind of streams of integration. Um, One is industry agnostic things, um, Microsoft Suite, uh, uh, email systems, uh, SMS, internal messaging systems, those kind of um, industry agnostic tools, uh, Xero software. uh, So for payments and revenue processing, of course, that's become important. And we also have industry specific. So that's where we've invested time. Uh, is around X-Plan integration, uh, coin, uh, for what it's worth now, with respect to those coin past and present, and uh, coin midwinter. So they're the, probably with X, between X-Plan and midwinter, they're the two main advice tools. Because what we what we are not is we are not the advice production tool. So, so let's, let's do this, because I think this is a big one. And I think for me, there's a lot of, I, I remember when, they, what was the name of that? Practify. Do you remember that tool? Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's still around. But yeah. you go and look at it and it looks great with Salesforce. But then again, you yeah. it wasn't a standalone tool. It was a tool yeah. that you needed to plug in. So yeah. can we just try, have a crack at just drawing a quick diagram? So yeah. if you're using um, WorkSorted, yeah. essentially the focus of this and I'm just uh, is WorkSorted is going gonna, is, is gonna to do your, your workflow. Yeah. Client it's going to do your records so file notes all that sort of day-to-day tracking of who did what by when yeah. and it's going to manage your revenue yeah what else do you need to bring into the mix in order to for most businesses to kind of complete the yeah you know the the party so to speak so uh, what would ordinarily happen is um, as our license is across the business everyone in the firm would have a seat at the table for work sorted fundamentally very important every there's no shared logins. There's none of that rubbish. Um, you, 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 are, you are each contributing as members of your practice to the work sort of database. Very important from a compliance and tracking perspective, right? So okay. everyone gets a seat on work sorted under the license. What we espouse is that, let's say we're starting up a new business from scratch, you will need a you will need something that can structure your advice. Now, of course, different businesses offer different types of advice. Um, some in the self-managed super space, some in the aged care space, some in the investment planning space, some in the superannuation and retirement planning, right? So what 
from this, the diagram can become pretty busy, Stuart, because yep. you, you could end up, depending on the type of advice, you may need three or four different advice tools to most appropriately deliver best of breed advice, the yep. fastest you can do it, whatever your objectives are around that. You may have three or four individual tools that drive your advice production. Okay. So, but ultimately, if you're, if you're somebody who's using a word template, and you're producing it, that's that's fine. If you want to go out there and, and, and have like a tool that will literally produce it from a, from a bunch of coding, as long as yeah. you can produce the documentation, then presumably you'd yeah. upload that documentation into work sorted as your, right. your single through. Yeah. So what what else? Example, just to pick up on that, we, we've got a, a Word Microsoft Word plugin that does pretty much what you're just suggesting there, drags data out of work sorted, puts it into a templated Word document. Upon saving that Word document, copy of it sent back into work sorted against the client record, right? So that's a simple loop of integrations. Okay. What about um, outbound communication on mass? Is that something yeah. you do from work? So yeah. in other words, you, you're okay. So email marketing, we, we turn around and say you could do that through work yeah. sorted or is it? Yeah. Okay. Kind of, yes, you could. SMS marketing, messaging, all process automated. You can automate all your communications with your clients. So we've got embedded email applications and we've got embedded SMS what about, for example, cloud storage? Yeah, you can, mate, we've got terabytes. Those integrations. Terabytes. I mean, and we popped up the, in that uh, net wealth survey, we popped up in a couple of categories, which we weren't expecting to. One was document management and storage, right? So it's like, oh, yeah, shit, yeah we do do that too, don't we? Um, oh, so that's, that's, that sits within you? Yeah, it's internal. Okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, you could you could store it out in some something else and loop it through, but... You know, as I was saying before, like the sky's the limit as far as integrations. And the last couple of years, we've invested a fair bit of time to build out our APIs and webhook structure. So it kind of now puts it in the hands of the practice to connect up with whatever the hell they want to connect up to. If you want HubSpot file notes to push in through as a file note into work sorted, knock yourself out. But So this kind of brings my next question. I'll just I'll turn this off. Like there's a couple of, I'm not going to name names, but there's a couple of tools out there who will say, oh, we, we can create APIs between different systems. Yeah. And then when you go and have a conversation with them, you realize they haven't built the APIs, <laughs> but they're happy to charge you to build the APIs as oh, and when yeah, it's right. needed, right? And then there's some systems out there where to get an API, it's kind of like you've got to fill in a form and post it in. And it's, it's like, if I'm, if I'm an advisor and I'm in a practice and I want, for example, I want my data um, to be shared with active campaign, or I want, you know, um, a automation to trigger something between that and my web, whatever it might be. Or right. when I set up a client in, in, in work sorted, I want them to provide access to my, my member site, which is maybe in, in WordPress. Yeah. Um, who, how do I go through building an API? Have I got to get a developer? Is it something you can do? Is it literally just a case of putting the key in and hitting a button? Yeah. Um, a good question. And I'll, Really try not to get too geeky. Just okay. stop me. Stop me if you think it's. Oh, I won't. <laughs> I won't be offended, man. Um, the trouble with AP. The trouble with APIs that you're kind of alluding to there is that, and I, I, I've seen this so much over the years, and it, it pisses me off, quite frankly. And um, uh, if you, we can always delete expletives out later, can't we? But uh, yeah, technology provider A says, "Oh yeah, I've got an API." Technology mm. provider B says, "Yeah, I've got an API too," and that's about where it ends because yeah. it's not enough. Um, and and without wanting to get too heavy into it, you need someone to build the connection between them, right? To say, yeah, I'm going to take stuff from there and use that API to push it into there. So that connection has to be done. And all too often there's talk about integration potential between, you know, potential technology partners. And it ends at, at about the point of, yeah, I'll send you the link to my API or I'll send you the URL. You can, knock yourself out and go and look at the documents. Good luck with yeah. that. Um, so there is a big gap in that happening. But even if, oh, and there are, just to throw in this, uh, there's other kind of connection tools that are relatively new. I mean, five, six, maybe more years. I could be wrong by a couple. But things like Zapier and yep. Pipe Dream as opposed to Pipe Drive, the sales tool, um, they, they kind of take those two connections and, and encourage or the two ends of the spectrum and encourage each of the firms to go the next step and to build their connection tools sufficient so that when those two come together, something like Zapier can be really easily used by um, technicians, probably not, you know, normal people that you see in, in advice practices, but for the 
bigger practices, those who want to really get serious about this. You don't need too much of a skill set to build, you know, get a young, usually a young kid that comes in and is happy to kind of connect those dots in the API yeah. using something like Zapier. So did I go down the right track? There? No, no, this is perfect. And I think this is a really good point. There's a, there's a, this is one of these I did with a lady called Debbie French. It was called Mastering Practice Technology. And this was a firm who, a lot of the times you go and you talk to firms about technology, they go, ah, oh, I just can't get it to do what I want. Yeah. And every single time I was on a webinar with, with Debbie there, and she was always the same, it's great, we can get it to do. And I wanted to understand the difference. And you'd know about the paradox of automation, which is the more automation you have in a, in a, in a, in a system, the more human oversight you require. Right. And this is the thing with Zapier. You need, you need like, it's kind of like, it's kind of like wiring a plug. It's not perfect. You know, you've got to find roundabout ways of doing it. But if you don't have somebody that's going to sit there and monitor it and make sure it's doing it, it breaks it, it, you know, one connection goes off and you can just end up with, with um, all sorts of problems. And I think this is the thing. It's like, if you're going to go down that route of wanting to have multiple tools doing different things, best of breed, and you don't have someone in your business who you know knows better than everybody else how this works and can fix it in a heartbeat, yeah. you, you're kind of going down a route where your system's going to break and you're not going to be able to fix it. Yeah, but it also becomes one of those questions that were asked, you know, about integrations, what's the potential? It's whatever you like or whatever. Yeah. Like, we're not going to do all of it. And I think back to our MLC days, and we handed advisors a pretty neat piece of interconnected software in Advisor Central. It was, it was pretty good, right? And yeah. And a lot of nice connection points. But you know, that was a what two hundred million dollars spend or something to create that. Was, um, it was, it was, a, was it two, two, yeah two twenty whatever they said it was yeah um, give or take yeah. three million. Uh, but it, it doesn't cost anywhere near that to connect things up. You spot on. You need a resource in house, but but it's no. There's no longer anyone investing the big money in tech like MLC was back in those days, or AMP have over the years, and will continue to do so with their Salesforce bill, which I think is still going. Um, like. So it's not going to be handed to advice practices on a platter anymore. If I can, no. I'm not being disrespectful in that, but it was, you know, it was landed and, and it was given un, unto the practice and the practice would, you know, take it on, not necessarily willingly, but accepting of what was delivered to them. Whereas now practices have got to go and chase what they want to build themselves um, and do a bit of that work. I think <laughs> because there's no alternative at, at the moment. I, I agree. The biggest practices that I've worked with, the people who get to that point where they're, you know, they're, they're getting passed through $4 million worth of revenue. They've got, you know, 20, 30 people. They build their own tools. Yeah. Because ultimately, they, they have their own compliance. They they have their own licenses. They build their own tools. So your uh, power's about to go, isn't it? Give me two, give me two shakes. I've got a, no, no, it's all good. You had to look on you. <laughs> Sometimes I'll be having coaching meetings and you just get this look on someone's face and you're like, oh, your, your power brick's about to go. So, um, and I'm just going to tap that. Can I just say the artwork in the background is fabulous? I was about to drop out with no battery. That one no, it's all good. Tech, I've right? had it happen. I had it. I had it happen to me once, and uh, thankfully the guy, the guy who was on the webinar, managed to do a bit of a tap dance and keep everyone going until I got back up. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, I was. No, it's all all good. Um, I think it's probably a good good time to sort of jump into that. I'm going to pull out for a couple of questions in a bit. So if there are any more questions, anything that's piquing your interest, please just jump over to the Q&A, guys, and, and, and just let me know what you want to know. And if there's anything that's particularly useful or you've found interesting, I'd love you to pop that in there and I'll, I'll just dip in there. When you look at the tool, um, what are the businesses that tend to get the best benefit from something like work, work Sorted? And what are those that you tend to look at and go, you don't need this. You shouldn't focus on, you shouldn't be going down this route. You should be going down a different route. Yeah, I, I think the most value comes, yeah, larger firms get the most value because of our the way we're structured in our licensing. That's yep. one thing to say. So we have attracted some quite large firms, you know, what are they fighting above our weight in terms of the size of practices that deal with us. But we have all the practices great and small. Um in another sense, so large firms and, and those that are offshoring and, and outsourcing and have kind of got, you know, a large number of users and need to kind of manage all that workflow around a large client base. Um, we've had great success with aligned firms. So, you know, those aligned to the larger institution groups like AMP and you know, yeah. over the years, maybe that's courtesy of my background. I'm not too sure, but um, the large groups. And we tend to... We tend to have attracted the renegades a little bit. So they're <laughs> early adopters naturally. But what the value that 
many of those get out of what we do. And the reason they fight so hard to retain us, and that's often despite, you know, the institution saying we've got this new shiny thing that we've paid tens or hundreds of millions of dollars for, you will use it. Um, we get those who will say no. And uh, the primary value that they get out of our system is what we've sometimes termed uh, data independence, control of their own data. And that's, right. it flies a little bit in the face of this kind of the, the, the licensee must, you know how the legislation now suggests they've got to have complete control and complete access and complete, after fee for no service stuff, make sure they know what they're delivering. So this, it's against this sense of control that the institutions have tried to lay down, but you know, we've still been growing in licensees who um, haven't stopped, have stopped short of saying you can't use Worksort, but they have been extremely encouraging of them to use their uh, out of the box solution. It's, it's interesting. It used to be a thing, right? You, you can't use it. And now I, I just don't think licensees have the polling power to turn around and go, you can't use that anymore. It's, it's particularly hard. I think I don't, we shouldn't mention names, but anyway. No. Um, I'm going to take a few questions, actually, and then I want to circle back and talk a little bit about um, where things are at now and where, where you're headed. Um, yeah. Stephen, really good question. And we, we sort of skipped over it, so I want to come back. What have been your biggest challenges in growing the business? I mean, like he put an example, has it been finding people, finding the funding to get the people, knowing what to build? Um, oh, no, certainly not knowing what to build. That's, that's easy. That, that's okay. an really easy bit. Um, I, I think balancing risk, I, I'm not particularly, a, I'm somewhat risk averse, I guess, in, in many respects. Um, you know, back to the comments before about wanting to run it profitably and sensibly and conservatively. So the thing that's probably held the business back is um, the founder's attitude <laughs> towards risk, right? Just doing it a bit differently. We could have we could have thrown a, another 10 developers on, but, you know, it's just been, I've just wanted it to be steady as she goes, good solid growth year on year. Um, so funding hasn't been the problem, back to Steve's earlier suggestion. It, it's not been, yep. it's, it's been, I mean, the first couple of years it was, what do they call it? Bootstrapped, you know, like tip of money. Bootstrapped. Yeah, not good you know, word. That's the same. You like that one? Um, I'm getting up with the lingo. Uh, bootstrapped. Yeah, yeah. Bootstrapped. So yeah, like I fund self funded it for the first few years. So it took a bit of time from a funding perspective to get that into the positive zone and be getting out of it what we needed to. But since then, I think we've had the right kind of pace. That the challenges have probably been perhaps somewhat geographically based in Adelaide. Um, not being in the you know in the in the big smoke of Sydney Melbourne not not so networking not as strong like uh, we've been we've kept to ourselves a little bit so if mm. in hindsight I probably would have shouted a few more things from the rooftop a bit sooner and perhaps travelled a bit more and and got the business out and about a little bit more than we have we, we sort of stuck to our own devices and um, and kept to ourselves for a little bit too long so that's probably yeah. the biggest struggle we've now got still is to get the name out there and. Um, and now I think a, a bit a compounding problem is that because our system does so much and it is different from what others do in many respects, um, we kind of get pigeonholed into various categories of what we are and what we're not. Like one of the biggest struggles was from an industry analysis perspective, people would come around to fintechs and um, and they would they would score you against how you rated against uh, an X plan or you know or a coin, right? The things that you did, and so they'd score you as a 30%, what a terrible job work sort of. But I think NetWealth have done pretty well at getting us out of that zone and they're kind of looking at the industry a lot more cleverly in the way they, yep. they um, categorise us. So I think one of the problems we had, just to come back to the question, is that we were kind of, we were pigeonholed too much up against tools that really had nothing to do with what we wanted to be. Yeah, that makes sense. Um Tim, Tim asked a question about making X-Plan more user-friendly. I don't really understand how... Uh, does that question mean much to you? Because obviously we're not talking about X-Plan. No. Um, no? Okay. Not particularly. Uh, um, sure Alex has got a really good one, and I want to ask this one because it's, it's, it's awesome. What's your favourite tips or hacks? What are you laughing, Alex? Is a, you guys know each other? No, I don't know, Alex, but <laughs> I, I'm scared for his question because you're loving it. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a work sort of user and would love to know Dan's favourite tips or hacks. What are the best automated processes Dan's has seen in the system? See, it's, it's uh, a harmless question. 
Okay, well, I might have some news for Alex because you've asked me to, to give away some things uh, later in the session. So mm -hmm. I, I can perhaps give Alex a little bit more time than the two-minute answer to that question. Let's put it that way for now. Okay. Um, All right. Well, well given yeah. we've got like five minutes left, do you want to do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Oh, okay. But just maybe to give Alex a little bit of something to take away in the absence of anything else. Um, one of the... One session I ran ages ago, I'd have, I've been a little bit out of work sort of for the last couple of years with it run by others presently, and, and that's been, been kind of fun in some ways. But one of the sessions I ran a few years ago was precisely that, was I just picked up like there's hundreds and hundreds of automated processes in the system. I think that's one classic place to look for some tips and, and ideas. There's hundreds of them. In fact, it might be thousands. So... They're running like all day, every day. And all I did for one session was I pulled out the top 10 things that people are doing and, and I, I rated them based on the volume of activity that they were delivering. So it was, you know, a simple example, of a birthday message being sent out, right, automatically. It's a pretty basic example. But we've, we've seen a lot of growth in the automation and it works really neatly. And it's not just work. It's not just SMS messaging. It's emailing and and and, uh, and, and workflow and so on. So there's a lot in there. Um, what I might do, Alex, um, is this is slightly different off of what I was going to talk about later on, Stuart. But yep. um, if you want to send me an email, I'll, I might even go back through the exercise again, and we'll just drag out from real life case studies what what sort of driving workflow efficiency and practices through automations. Okay, what's the email they should email you on if they want to dive into some of those real life? It sounds like you've got a lot going on in there and it'd be really good to... The top 10. Jeez, sounds phenomenal. D, D Fitzgerald? D, no, D, not B. D, that, does, that wouldn't make sense, B. No, it wouldn't really. D, D Fitzgerald at worksorted.com. There we go. Worksorted.com. Okay, and just email you and say, I am interested in knowing what your top 10 automations that I don't know about. That's, that's where you want to go with it. Yeah, cool. Cool. So let's, um, we've got a couple of minutes left. I'm really keen to sort of um, uh, talk a little bit about where it's headed, where you see the future, where it's going to be developing. But I think you mentioned if, someone, if anybody has to go early and, they, oops, and they, they do want to know a bit more about the tool or they'd like to you know, get in contact, they, there's, there's, a, there's a way that they can sort of take a first step, right? Yeah, first step, I guess, go to the website, usual traditional thing, or just email me directly if if you prefer. Um, yep. We'll get things underway. Um, you know, there's a there's team members in there that can take you through the application, have a look at it, see what you think, um, and so on. Um, okay. But yeah, so stock standard. You know, we, we we do. There's videos available online as well. I'm sure. So plenty of ways to get in touch. And okay. And is there anything special you want to talk about? Yeah, well, I thought because you, you suggested it might be an opportunity. There's, there's many on the call that don't know the first, didn't know the first thing about work sorted and yep. not known to me. But there are also some existing clients. So I thought we'd bundle something up for both of them just to um, see what we can do. Or, so for the existing clients, um, what I'd be really keen to do if they're keen to take up this offer is to sit with them and their teams virtually, of course. Um, we'll run a three-hour review session just to make sure they're getting the most out of work sorted. So I'll do that. I'm back in on the tools, have been for the last little while, as, as Donna knows. Um, nice. It'll be great. You know, Two-way benefit here. Um, I'll learn more about what's going on in your firms. I'll learn more about what you need from us that we may not have presently. And, and I can share with you what how you might be able to get more out of work sorted. Um, for non-users, one thing we can do, just to, it's a bit of a lower impact thing rather than, you know, signing up and, and you know, putting your change management life on the line for the next little while. I thought yeah. what we could do is, is we, we have a, a revenue analysis that we do. So we can backfill our system with 12 months worth of your revenue data and run some analysis against it for you um, down to client level if need be, but also just across product manufacturers and so on. And you may, we would not be surprised if we find, as we spoke about earlier, some underpayments, that would be a bonus. I'm not, I'm not guaranteeing that, but we can run a 12 month analysis and we'll do that at half price. We, we do need to pay some bills and keep our lights on. So uh, that's at 900 bucks. So that's normally just under two grand, is it? Yeah, normally 1800, so 900 okay. bucks, if anyone's interested. And obviously, yeah. yeah. So if anybody's listening to that and they're going, you know what, I have a funny feeling. 
Well, there's, yeah. there's more than nine hundred dollars under under. I've been underpaid there. You, this is an opportunity to yeah. Obviously, you can't yeah, promise it's, it's going to find anything. Yeah, it could just be a good way to to see a different cut and dice of your data too. Okay, and if someone wants to take you up on that, is it dfitzgerald at worksorted dot com? Yeah, that'll do. Yep, I'll handle it. Too easy. It. Sounds good, man. I reckon. I, do you know what I know? I think one of my clients is, is uh, has just discovered. Actually, you know what? I might put them in contact because um, they're going through a process. We've done a pricing um, transition, and they've been looking at the numbers and going, "That pricing transition doesn't look like it's come through." Oh yeah. And I reckon you might be able to help yeah, them. Yeah, a lot yeah. of it's. Yeah, yeah we've okay. got some pretty cool reports in software on, it, that does exactly that. So yeah. Jen, can you ma- can you make a note to email Dowell and Kirsten and just let them know about this because I reckon that would be uh, a good early Christmas present for them. Um, let's talk about where where things are headed. I mean, you, I think you mentioned you've now got ten percent market share. How many you mentioned you got? How many users on the platform now? How many businesses? Uh, each day we our, our usual daily stat is just over two thousand uh, active users, like real life users that get in and spend a ton of time with us. Um, yeah, so that's. Yeah, that, that's that's a really good number, and that's the one we're interested in. It's not so much practice numbers. I don't even know what the advisor numbers are that we we support, but it's that we want to know that people are using it and are actually active in software with us day in day out. So yeah, that's a good number, and as I said, it represents around about a ten percent, maybe a bit short of that. Um, where's where's the future taking us? I mean, yeah, we'd like to grow that. Uh, we think we will get growth um, just organically. Uh, we'll get sufficient growth. Um, you know, things have slowed a little bit in the last year or two, probably the last year more so. Through the start of COVID, we we're doing pretty well. We we're flying pretty nicely. That trajectory continued. But, yeah, things have kind of softened just a touch. But there's plenty in the pipeline, so we're not too, we're not too stressed about that at all. Uh, still very, very good growth rates. Um, what are we looking at? I think focusing on what we do and do well and just, again, without labouring too much detail on it is getting better about our ability to connect with other systems or different types of systems, industry agnostic mm. otherwise. Um, and the challenge for us will be how far do we step into providing that service around actually connecting the dots? Because I just don't see too many glimpses out of practices that suggest they've got the capability or certainly the capacity, but not the capability nor real intention to get too geeky on that stuff. So I think mm. some group needs to step up and say, we will connect those dots for you. Um, One of the examples I've always liked to trot out is, I remember because I'm like you, I, I got into computers when there was 286s and the Mega 500s, and I've broken so many 286s, it's not funny. But I, I remember... You know, there was a point in time where to use a computer, you had to know what the DOS commands were. And equally importantly, you had to know what not. To. Dell, Dell all is a bad command to use, for example. Yes. But there's a point, like, um, I think uh, Tim Cook tells this story. I think he was traveling. It might have been Africa. It might have been South America. But he had a prototype iPad with him. Oh, yeah. And as when you're traveling, you probably know, you know, kids tend to be the friendliest, right? They're kind of like, hey. And he gave the kids his iPad. And within minutes, they're swiping. And he realized at that point in time, he'd done... He built the world's first computer that didn't require an operating manual. Mm. Anybody could use it. And I think, you know, where we've come from as an industry, we've got some, a lot of, I mean, they've got, we've got tools out there that are much, a lot of people malign certain tools, but in truth, they're very powerful. But I think we've got to find that blend of something that is uh, easy enough that it can be like the iPad, but also powerful enough to, to do what, what, what practices need. And I think if we can hit that, t- hit that sort of balance, which I think you spoke about beautifully, then we're going to have something that's that hits the mark. Well, yeah, and we are challenged with that too. Like, sort of, we've been building out, building out, building out so much. We now sit in so many different categories of industry stats and whatever. But we we do have to still invest more time to bring that back in and yeah. keep simplifying it. Um, and that, you know, do do you want to build more things or do you want to make the things you've got work better? So yeah, we've got we're not perfect in any sense. Um, but I think it, what we we will just keep staying close to that practitioner uh, and their yep. environments and delivering for them and rather than taking ourselves into some crazy expectations of growth or or strategic alignment with partners that are just going to take us. 100%. Yeah. I lived in Japan for two years and I love the Japanese sensibility around design and it's basically, in a nutshell, perfection is when you can no longer take anything else away. And that's just like reduced it down. I think that's the good, beautiful thing. Guys, um, Dan, this has been awesome. <laughs> Man, I could talk to you for hours. Alex, Amy, Desiree, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Donna, Elizabeth, hello, Eddie, 
Greg, Simon, Stephen, you're still here. I would love you to head over to the Q&A box and do me a favor. Can you just give me a quick idea of what's been the most useful part of the conversation? What are you leaving here with um, sort of insight? Is there any particular comment that's been made or a part of the discussion which has um, really hit home or something that you sort of reflect upon as, has been has reinforced where you're headed? Just give us a little bit of feedback because I'm one of these people who definitely has an above average need for feedback and validation and that sort of stuff. And while I'm waiting for people's come, things to come through, um, Dan, what's your biggest predictions over the next 12 months for advice? Ooh. Yeah, I know. Big, big curly question. Uh, this, this may shock you, but I don't think there'll be much going on at all in the next year or two. I think Ooh. we're going to have a, a period just for the next two or three years before this, you know, the new stuff that's coming out now. I think it's going to be a bit of a hiatus. Good opportunity for us to just, for advice firms to focus on their clients, deliver good service for us to provide, keep doing what we do. Um, I think it's going to be a nice little period for serious improvements rather than chasing our tail on, you know, trying to fix stuff from before and, you know, remediations and all that. It's kind of getting behind us now. So I'm very, very buoyant and positive about the sector for the next 12 to 24 months. I think what I've taken from our conversation is a realization. Um, I like I like the fact that you've gone on a pathway that you've kind of while ever, all of this evolution has been going on around you, you've been very clear about where you're going. You've you maintained this clarity on what you're building. I think the points that you make about simplicity, integration is spot on, and I just think what you're building in terms of um, yeah, I mean, like those automations sound excellent. I mean, we in our business channels tell you have been on a similar sort of route to building. Workflow and absolutely for, for me, that's one of the keys once you get up a certain level. And the fact that you've got automations in the background, powerful. I'm just going to run through some of the feedback. Simon, uh, Greg, would love to get some from you as well. Alex just turned around and said, awesome. Uh, Amy says, life changing for our business. Elizabeth, I said, that I think her, her biggest insight was that you need a specialist person on board to integrate APIs. I think someone else made a comment. They might have deleted it since. Um, oh, answered, yeah. But, um, mate. Oh, we've got some more coming through. Desiree, a better idea of the background and the best fit of where work sort of, work sort of fits in our business. We're a new potential user of work sorted and can see the benefits of getting the flow of workflow to better. We have never had revenue tracking, so we'll be interested to see what we find. Revenue tracking is a bit of a game changer. Like it's, it's, I'm, I've seen businesses that implemented back in the Heroes days mm. and suddenly it just gives you this insight. Um, yeah, as well as you can often pick up some some. Big missing pieces. Donna, mm. great to see you, Dan. Love using work sort of looking to use it for our workflows other than for FP. Ooh, interested. And it's important to learn as much as we can about what IT solutions are available. Agreed. It's important to learn. I, I'll say that. I think it's important to learn as much as you can, as long as you know what you're looking for. If you go out to the marketplace, not knowing what you need, everything is going to look awesome. And that's that's one of the issues. Very true. Dan, any final thoughts? No, thank you, Stu. Thanks for the opportunity to be on. Awesome. I Thank you so much for your time. Everybody, Thanks for joining us today. Have a great weekend, whatever you're doing, and uh, I'll speak to you all soon. Thanks again, Dan. Right. See ya. Take care. Bye.